Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Nicola and today I'm joined by my dear friends Julie and Clay Engels. They are the certified interventionists and the founders of Roots Collaborative. Welcome to the show. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you for having us. Such a pleasure. Today we're going to discuss how families can come together to help recover from addiction. And my first question to you is what is invitational intervention? So an intervention in somewhat of an old format would be jumping out of a closet, you got to get on a plane, you're going to treatment now. And it's very confrontational. Mm. Um, and so with the uh, invitational intervention, what the families are doing is we get that first call and we start to understand the family and we help them come up with a message to invite other family members to participate. It's all very loving. It's not shame, blame, and guilt driven. That's a safe space that we create. That's, that's part of our job. Um, and we work with that first caller, that family member, to create that sort of atmosphere and that mentality for mm -hmm. all the people that are involved. And we like to have more the merrier in an intervention. Uh, you know, so that would be aunts, uncles, brothers, cousins, best friends, because when it comes to the illness of substance abuse is just a symptom of, a, of an illness, uh, you know, alcoholism, eating disorders, uh, that illness needs a network to help heal. And so that individual, that the person of concern is, uh, is what in the industry is the terminology used. That person of concern needs that network to heal as well as themselves. So with the invitation, you're inviting all the family members uh, and loved ones, and then inviting the individual. So hey, on Saturday, we're all coming together. We'd love for you to come and participate. Uh, we hope you do, but we're still gonna hold that, you know, that family network meeting. And so, more often than not, that individual does show up, even just out of curiosity. Um, like, oh, what are they talking about? They're talking about me, or I need to be there to defend myself, or whatever those things are. But it, nobody's jumping out of a closet. So already the energy is, is very loving and approachable for all. Uh, and so it's evidence-based that the more you have in that family network, that, that first you know, group meeting, uh, the more folks that you have there, the longer they continue to stay engaged. Mm -hmm. The odds of the individual going to treatment is greatly increased. Also, them staying at treatment through the entire process, because quite often in some of those, you know, the intervention show or whatever on... It's one Amy. Amy. Yeah, so a lot of those folks actually bounce within a few weeks of being in treatment what we're creating is a buy-in from the person of concern. Like, oh, there's definitely something going on and I, I'm willing to participate in my own recovery. And so then they will. They'll have ups and downs while they're in treatment, that's part of the process. But they will stay engaged for the majority of it and then complete that. Uh, and then I think we can go in further as we continue to talk about the type of modeling uh, that we do uh, it's, it's a six-month commitment from everybody that's participating. It's a whole family affair, really. Mm. I love that. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Well, and I think to add to what Clay was talking about, that first meeting that we host in person, sometimes if somebody can't make it to the meeting in person, we'll, do, we'll include them in FaceTime or Zoom or in a conference call. And the first thing that we look at besides setting sort of the respectful ground rules of how we're going to talk to each other with like love and grace and kindness is then we'll do a genogram um, which talks about the family system on all sides so both mom and dad and then their parents and grandparents etc mm -hmm. and uh, a, a belief with addiction is that trauma and grief that started to happen generations before whether that's um, great grandparents immigrating to this country or you know loss in the war miscarriages you name it that's happening in families and unless those um, specific events are dealt with through a grieving process or put to bed in the right way the ghosts sort of 
continue to trickle down and those start to show up like addiction in the next generations. And so oftentimes we love to work with young people because oftentimes a young person will say, you know, I, I live in Aspen or I live in Chicago or wherever these, you know, great places to live relative to maybe where their grandparents were. And they're like, I, I have a pretty good life. I'm not sure why I'm so disturbed inside. And a lot of it is because they're carrying those ghosts, but they don't know how to put a name to it. And so our process allows that person of concern not to be the scapegoat and um, the identified patient, as we call it, and they move into being a family member amongst a bigger family that has to heal. And that's the exciting part is um, oftentimes if that isn't happening, the person at any age who goes off to treatment then will come back and they've continued to heal and the family still stayed stuck in older patterns and things that used to work and were survival mechanisms this person has changed, this family hasn't, and it makes it very uncomfortable for that person to have any kind of sustainable sobriety or recovery. And oftentimes either those people can relapse or have chronic relapsing, or they'll move. Mm -hmm. And there's a disconnect between the family and that person. And what this model does, and where we got trained is called Arise, um, through this woman, Dr. Judith Landau, and she's amazing, so um, we'll, give you that website information so if people want to tune in and kind of look at what she does. She has a good TED talk too. Um, but she's looked at a ton of evidence about how this works intergenerationally. And it's, it's fascinating. I mean, when we start to hear our clients' histories, one wonders, like, how do people, how are people still standing <laughs> with I've what they've been through? Right, it's true. I've never heard of this technique with an addiction recovery. Usually mm -hmm. you're just dealing with this lifetime. Mm -hmm. right. But it's true, my grandparents were in the Holocaust. I mean, yeah. Imagine what that's passed down. Yeah. It's fascinating. Right. Well, and I think some of the um, behaviors or the unwritten rules, like we don't talk about that, or you know, when we get asked, when we ask questions about maybe what did happen in the Holocaust, if your grandparents aren't open about it, it's like this kind of blank slate for the young person and so you, like, you pick up the energy. Yeah. And I think a lot of, um, you know, when you're young and you start to feel uncomfortable in your skin and you don't have great modeling for a variety of reasons ab about how to speak to your emotions, that's where they get subsidized by, you know, different things that take you out of your body in the moment, whether right. that's, you know, gambling, sex, you know, our phones, um, yeah. you name it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you, you hit it before as well, the coping strategies. Mm -hmm. These are your survival strategies mm -hmm. that, that also got passed down. Oh, absolutely. And if they're resorting in anger, you know, to push some something mm -hmm. away that you're scared of, or you know, whatever the techniques are, it's interesting. Yeah, well, and I think when you, one of the things that we often have to remind ourselves of is even if somebody's behavior to your point like anger you know in in a, in a more ordinary viewpoint like want to shame the person who's angry or condemn them for that anger and what we're looking at is what is the origin of that versus don't act like that and um, because they're probably not choosing that behavior just like people don't choose addiction you know and in our society we're getting more educated um, about how addiction plays out and that it's a brain disease and not a choice and a weakness morally that somebody's making to go out and if they were only stronger they wouldn't be a meth addict hmm. um, and so it's a, and a lot of times families their their uh, communication process even if they think they don't have those thought processes, language tells you otherwise. And so we're sort of like the rudder um, on these weekly phone calls that we have via Zoom for six months where the whole family will dial in and we'll host kind of like a family board meeting. Um, we're not therapists, so we always encourage everyone to have their own therapist or their own outlet for 
for recovery, whether that's Al-Anon meetings, Alateen, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, like you name it, there's lots of different ways to recover and it doesn't have to be a 12-step model either, um, but they're held accountable to that. And on the phones, on the phone calls, we bring up more agenda items um, that are hot to talk about during the week. Yeah, so. We follow a, a, a protocol. Yeah. Um, so then that following the protocol allows us to be experts in our field and then allows the family to be, be experts in their family. Mm. And so it's really empowering. Uh, because we're not using a, a therapeutic model there, where it's a very specific protocol that we follow, people are coming to realizations on their own. We're not leading them, you know, horse to water. Yeah. Uh, it, it all starts to take on its own shape, and they become aware of their own behaviors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that we do start out with, with the initial... Uh, family meeting, we'll call it, um, is the family strengths. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those strengths that help their generations down the road are becoming less of a strength and becoming um, s something that's hindering uh, a well-being. So, but they can always look back at, you know, uh, you know, tenacity, courage, you know, a lot of different family strengths that, that are extremely powerful and help them get past that last generation. But now some of that courage and isolating from community um, can now be a hindrance. Yeah, It's and, like you're getting diminishing returns yeah. from those strengths. And so what we do is we take those strengths that they list and we help them use those and reposition patterns for recovery and health. And to Clay's point, you know, people are having light bulb moments of their own, and that's much more powerful than us pointing that out. You right. know, we can we ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. um, like, oh, does that feel familiar? When did when was this helpful when you were a child? Or who do you you know when do you first remember being courageous and dealing with something on your own? And, you know, people have a pretty clear memory of when those things started happening in their family. And it's, it's really great. And then the other thing that we come up with is sort of like a recovery message, which is for kind of common day vernacular, like if you have a startup or a company, you would have your mission statement. So it's like a family vision mission statement that then they hold themselves accountable to. So if you start looking at behavior, and if I'm, let's say, the person who has the illness of alcoholism, and I'm relapsing, and let's say I'm not telling anybody about it, and on a family call, we can ask, like, is this, is this part, is this helping our family recovery message, our behaviors? And do we want to be accountable to that? So it's really putting all the tools back into the family's hands because they're the ones that are going to create a future for the next generation that could be, you know, addiction free and have less mental health challenges. And I think that's really what rallies people who ordinarily don't want to talk about these things. <laughs> if you're like, well, your grandkids could be free and not have to deal with this. And it, it is our belief that if if you don't deal with it, not it will- Not even belief, it's evidence-based. It's evidence-based, yeah. yeah. but we believe that, yeah. that it will show up in junior or, you know, whatever we, the equivalent of the, a young woman child yeah. is, yeah, a woman child. We pass on the, yeah. these techniques of mm -hmm. uh, yeah. managing our stress levels. Yeah. And they're not all healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there any other family struggles that you come across that are very evident? Um, well, quite often the substance abuse and alcoholism is them trying to self-medicate. Right. And, and also with uh, food disorders. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can trace back prior behaviors before plugging in the actual use of food or substances um, that they're already trying to express things that are going on for themselves that they can articulate and feel once or twice removed from anybody else's reality. Yeah. Um, and so those are very prevalent. You know, we do work with families. And, 
And once you start to scratch, you know, the tip of the iceberg, it, in the, the process of creating the genogram, you can really see, and it's interesting for the younger members of the family, once like the grandparents, you know, who are also there saying, well, my sister, you know, was anorexic, you know, or, you know, the father was like, M my brother took his wife. You know, and so in, in the younger generations, like, really, I didn't know that, you know, yeah. because these things just hadn't come into focus, hadn't, you know, just depending on the family communication style. But when plugging into the genogram, it's more storytelling. And so it yeah. takes the energy out of it. And it really relieves that person of concern. Yeah. They're no longer the focus of the conversation, right? Everybody's gathered yeah. and then we start to create the genogram and it really takes the focus off of that person. And then they start to participate and then the light bulbs start going on for them. Yeah. Like, holy crap, I'm not alone. I didn't, rem I didn't know that Aunt Judy, you know, was anorexic, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so then they're not alone. Yeah. You know, well, and so they came by their challenges honestly, like, yeah. oh my. And so it's a really powerful moment, not only for the person of concern, but the entire family starts to see these patterns, you know, yeah. and, yeah. And, and it is very important to take the shame, blame, and guilt away. And that's, you know, the family strengths and the recovery message. And these are all tools that we're there helping to facilitate because this is real. You know, and nobody's to blame here. And, you know, we need to get into some of this for sustainable recovery. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because um, coming back to then the person of concern who usually, if we have a clear understanding that someone does need treatment or whatever that treatment looks like, will have done some due diligence with the family about where that could be. So that is standard in many intervention um, protocols. So after that person of concern has seen all these dynamics in their family, and then you know we turn to that person, we're like, listen, we're worried about you for X, Y, and Z reason, and we don't want this to be your fate. Yeah. You right. know, this is not, it's not your fault, and this is the road you're going down. And it could be any of us. It's like, you know, tic-tac-toe or, you know, duck, duck, goose at any moment and families that have a history of, of the ism. Um, but in the moment, it's, it just happens to be this person. And that becomes such a resting place for them. Mm -hmm. um, it can be difficult moving forward to continue to release them from the hot seat because families tend to want to focus on what they think is the problem. If Junior gets better, we'll be fine. And what we're there to put training wheels on for six months or sometimes more is what is everyone doing for their recovery? Because caretaking, or sometimes known as codependency, um, is equally as much of the illness as the ism being expressed through drinking too much or whatever the addiction is. The other side is equally as... Um, diminishing for a family huh. and their wellness. It just reads differently. Interesting. I want to get to protocols uh, in, in sure. your, your system, but before we do, what constitutes a crisis? Well, I think from a family point of view, it's usually a moment in time that um, somebody has hit some kind of a tipping point that they're like, wow, this is unusual. Sometimes it can be a DUI. Sometimes it can be somebody has a heart attack because of anorexia. And, I mean, it really can be all over the map. Um, what we like to reframe and why a crisis is important is that it is that window of opportunity that's finite where the family is willing to change mm -hmm. and the person is willing to get help. Um, after that finite window closes, people are like, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. Um, and you know we like hasn't been drama for a week or yeah. two. We're okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, last week, you know, he had a DUI, but this week it's it's we're totally cool. So, as an outsider or what we would call a normal person, <laughs> normal people are like, that's really weird. That's not like okay. that's that's yeah. like really not okay. <laughs> not okay. But you become accustomed when you're in an alcoholic family or a family who's constantly in trauma crisis, things become super normal. 
and you don't even see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why oftentimes people who are either a caretaker or they have the illness themselves, um, when we meet one another, like Clay and I are in long-term recovery, and you know, his when we met, we're like, oh my God, I love him. Because we're so used to, and he's like, she's amazing. You know, and we look back at where we were 10 years ago, and we both had long-term sobriety at that point, but we've come so much further in the 10 years with the things that we're still recovering from. That It's kind of funny now, like I'm recovering from an eating disorder, and I'm thin now, that I was way thinner then, and we look back at pictures and we're like, oh my God, like how do we not see that? Wow. But he has sisters who... Have both struggled with eating with disorders. With eating disorders, and his so mom it's like a blind spot, you know? He can't see. Mm -hmm. as well, as normal. Yeah. It becomes it's normal. normal. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I love that. Like if, I mean, I wouldn't have said, oh, I'm picking a partner who can't see that I'm <laughs> incredibly thin. No, he accepted you as you were yeah. in that yeah. condition. So yeah. it's yeah. it's it's like it's so um, spiritually deep that it's hard. Like science wants to solve it, and yet there's such a spiritual, emotional side to recovery that goes. It's cellular. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, which I know you're all about, which yeah. is why we're probably here right. and friends. For sure. I mean, it's, uh, addiction, disease, a lot of, mm -hmm. so much of it is sourced in our in our head and our thoughts, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. absolutely, we, we govern this body in yeah. very interesting ways. Uh, all right, so let's get to this protocol. I'm interested to hear what is the Arise protocol. So the Arise protocol, again, founded by. Um, Dr. Judith Landau, who happens to live in Vail, and she has tons of initials after her name. She's a child psychiatrist, and then it goes on from there. And she started to test this model from a, um, a DNA point of view, as well as what gets passed on cellularly through trauma and grief, and shows up as addiction. And so this model is, um, the protocol is what we said, which is, um, we get a first caller, and we take as much information about the fam first, you know, are you okay? Is the person of concern okay? We try to find out as much as we can about the family. If it seems like a good fit that they want to work with us because they believe in this family systems model, they'll set up a first meeting. We give them the information, sign contracts, whatever, and then we determine that first place. We have the meeting in person. Um, that person oftentimes will go into treatment or they will make uh, some kind of a commitment to recovery, whether that's drinking less, you know, checking out a meeting, going to a therapist, but some measure to go forward. And then we move into family comprehensive care. And we, we feel like the illness lives in the one-to-one -one where Clay and I, like one-to-one -one is Clay and I talk and tell each other things and then Clay talks to our daughter and they tell each other things and the daughter comes and talks to us. So the illness lives in these one-on-ones. Huh. In transparency where the whole family is talking, the illness can't get very far, right? Because it's transparent, we're all telling the same story. Um, and in these calls, Clay and I, as the Arise interventionists and doing the comprehensive care, we don't do one-to-ones with the family either. So everything is an email, group email. If you weren't on the phone call this week, somebody from the family takes notes. The notes are emailed within a few days of the family meeting wow. so everyone can read them. If someone happens to be in a treatment center, they call in with their counselor mm -hmm. from yeah. as soon as the counselor and that team deems it okay. Um, and then we, fam we follow the family. So even if person of concern has to go into a lower level of care, we might be the only people that follow that case for six months and are familiar with the entire family story. Um, because there's a lot that's lost in translation. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. with the illness, there is relapse or you know transitions that take place. And that's a very vulnerable place for a family. So having the protocols, setting the stage you know, for transparency, no shame, blame, and guilt, um, Having time limits on certain things, having agenda points, um, you know, it's really a, a, a recovery democracy. Um, yeah. And then also holding each other accountable 
to, oh, well, last week you said you were going to go check out, you know, a new therapist. Or maybe it's a self-care thing. Uh, you weren't going to smoke cigarettes. I mean, whatever those yeah. things are for the, each individual, it's different for each person within that network. Uh, so holding each other accountable. Uh, but really being transparent through that whole, because what that transparency does is because there will be people that can't make it that week, they can't zoom into the call, but, it, but there's consistency, honesty, and accountability mm -hmm. that starts to really foster um, a very safe place for communication. Yeah, it sounds really supportive. It is. Yeah, in I, a loving way. Yeah. And I think what ends up happening is that people... Um, you know, we think it's the we think the person who has the expressed illness in in the disease, right, is the root of the issue. And if they just get better, everything will be okay. But then we find out that as the person who's the caretaker, the the behaviors that you're justifying to keep your person safe are equally as nuts. <laughs> As, as what they're doing with their using. Yeah, and so there can be, there's no middle ground to ever have a rational conversation because both sides of the illness are irrational. Interesting. And so it just brings some, some sensibility and connectivity into it. And then to Clay's point, if someone's in treatment and they're working their ass off every day, doing, going to like, you know, 10 hours of equine therapy and then group therapy, individual therapy, and then no one else in their family is doing anything, it's like they're back in that identified patient role. And so it's really important that on these family calls that whomever the family network is composed of, that they're also taking the time to figure out what they need to do to stay healthy.